Uh, I want to invite uh, Professor Michael Walzer uh, from the Institute for Advanced Studies at uh, Princeton University. Professor Walzer is very well known for his uh, books and researches in different issues in political philosophy, including spheres of justice, the company of critics, thick and thin, and about uh, just war theory in his different books, uh, Just and Unjust War, Arguing About War, etc. Professor Michael Walzer, please. So oh, I've, um, I've been in Israel just uh, two weeks uh, this time, and uh, if, the, uh, if the problem of fighting against uh, insurgent and terrorist groups were a uniquely Israeli problem, I wouldn't presume to talk to you about it after being here such a short time. Um, but this is uh, also an American, this is also an American problem. Um, I was recently lecturing on these questions at Annapolis at the Naval Academy, the U.S. Naval Academy, where I heard uh, Asa Kasher quoted. Um, he has joined an American debate, and so I feel licensed to join an, an Israeli debate. Um, it is, in fact, the same. The same, we face the same questions. So I have some disagreements with Asa which will be clear, but I'm going to not engage directly with what he said. I'm going to present my own uh, position, and then we can have a discussion uh, later on. I want to rehearse an argument that I've made before. People my age do that a lot. <laughs> um, and then apply it to the new circumstances of um, asymmetric warfare. <coughs> now, proportionality arguments are very old. And they've always been highly elastic, easily stretched to cover a lot of whatever needs to be covered. It's mostly civilian casualties that need to be covered, unintended but foreseeable collateral damage. You, you know how the argument works. Here is a factory making tanks for the German war effort during World War II. The factory is located in a working class neighborhood. It wasn't put there in order to benefit from civilian cover. That's where factories were built before workers had cars. The Allies believe that it's very important and they're right to stop the production of tanks for the German war effort. They do not intend to kill civilians, but they know that some number, possibly a large number of civilians living nearby, will be killed if they bomb the factory. Given the aiming devices available in 1943, they are certainly right about that. They believe that this number is not disproportionate to the value of destroying or even seriously damaging the factory. In fact, virtually any number would not be disproportionate um, to, to that uh, achievement. It's very hard to set a limit on how high the numbers can go. Proportionality was, or it used to be, a very permissive doctrine. So long as the injuries and deaths were not intended, there could be a large number of them, and no one would complain. I mean, no one except the injured civilians and the families of the dead. But there's something wrong with a limit that isn't limiting, at least not in any effective way. And so I argued 30 years ago, thinking of the Vietnamese War, that not intending the foreseeable deaths was not enough. It was necessary to intend that those deaths would not occur and to take positive measures that would minimize their number, even if these positive measures had costs. Well, they would certainly have costs. Even something as simple as warning civilians to get out of the way has the obvious cost of warning enemy soldiers to get ready for an attack. And then your own soldiers will have to deal with an enemy that is alert and prepared. And there, in that simple example, is the issue that I meant to raise 30 years ago and have been arguing about and worrying about ever since, the issue of risk. What risks should soldiers take to reduce the risks they are imposing on enemy civilians. 
Now, I stress, it's not what risks should soldiers take to protect enemy civilians. It's what risks should soldiers take to avoid killing enemy civilians. And then there is an additional issue should this last question be answered differently for different groups of civilians? Fellow citizens, enemy citizens, citizens of neutral states, uh, complicit citizens, innocent bystanders. There are many possible classifications of the group of, of non-combatants and, and should they make a difference? But I'm not gonna address that latter issue today. I don't think it often arises in the circumstances of asymmetric warfare where <coughs> Insurgent forces hide among their own civilians, and it is these civilians, enemy civilians, who are at risk in the ensuing military operations. Now, questions about risk are not easy, and I hope that I've never suggested that they're easy. The main point of my argument 30 years ago was simply to generate some resistance to the elasticity of proportionality calculations. I wanted soldiers and their officers to think about how to minimize civilian casualties, which they didn't have to do in the old days once they decided that the number of likely deaths was not disproportionate to the value of the military target, and that was easy to decide. As I've just said, it was too easy to decide that the likely deaths were not disproportionate. So the key phrase is some resistance to the old elasticity. My argument certainly didn't make the key factors any more precise. I can't do that now. What positive measures should soldiers take with what care, at what cost, at what risk? These were and are judgment calls. There's no possibility of saying the risk should be nine or 33. And, and even without precision, we also have to think about the limits to my limits. Since soldiers are already taking risks for the sake of their mission, any additional risks can't endanger the mission, else the first set of risks would be pointless. And that means more judgment calls, more necessarily rough estimates of probabilities. But these difficult judgments and estimates are morally necessary. Soldiers have to think about something besides proportionality. Call it responsibility. They have to take responsibility for the civilians they put at risk and for the deaths they cause, even in legitimate military operations. And they should try, as morally responsible people, to reduce the numbers. And in judging their conduct, we should always ask, who is responsible for putting these civilians in harm's way? Now, let's set risk and responsibility aside for a moment and turn back to proportionality. Something very strange has happened to the proportionality argument. The elastic has snapped back, and now it doesn't justify too much. It hardly justifies anything at all. The highly permissive doctrine has become a highly restrictive doctrine. The reason for this change has to do with the increasing number of asymmetric conflicts and what we might call the moral political surround of those conflicts. I, I mean by asymmetry, uh, a war or a series of engagements between small insurgent forces on one side who claim that they can only fight from civilian cover and can only attack vulnerable civilian populations. Terrorism isn't their last resort, but their only resort. And on the other side, modern high-tech armies. In the contemporary world, the high-tech armies tend to be the armies of democratic states, and the insurgent or terrorist forces are commonly hostile to democracy, but that, that's obviously a contingent, not a necessary fact. Actually, I think there is a contradiction between terrorism and democracy, though not between insurgency and democracy, but that's another subject for another time. So assume that the terrorist attacks on civilians are unsuccessful. 
Very few civilians are killed, which is what we hope for. Then it will turn out that most of the killing is done by the high-tech armies, responding to the attacks. The ratio of army killing to insurgent killing may get as high as 100 to 1, as it did in the Gaza war. And this looks disproportionate and is quickly criticized, denounced more accurately as disproportionate. And, it's, and that, that argument is made in, in two different ways. The first way is common, but certainly wrong. Think of how proportionality works in, say, a family feud in Kentucky. One family kills two members of another family. The second family gets to kill two members of the first family. That's a proportionate response. Nothing more is permitted, and everybody goes home. Any number higher than two is disproportionate. Here, proportionality is a backward-looking measure, and that's the way a lot of people understand it. That's the way the UN Secretary General seemed to understand it when he called the Israeli response to Hezbollah's 2006 raid disproportionate on the second day of the Lebanon War. <coughs> he seemed to think that the IDF should kill the same number of fighters as the Hezbollah raiders had killed, eight, capture the same number Two, and that would be that. That should be the end of the story. But this wasn't a family feud. In war, proportionality is a forward-looking measure. Unintended civilian deaths are supposed to be measured against the value of seizing or destroying a particular target, as in stopping the production of tanks in my earlier example, which seem to justify or allow a large number of civilian deaths. But if the target is a single terrorist cadre hiding in a village in Pakistan, say, or a rocket launching team in front of an apartment building in Gaza, as it often will be in asymmetric warfare, even a low number of civilian deaths will seem hard to justify. And it's in this context that proportionality arguments have become highly restrictive. We might argue for a cumulative measure. What's the military value not of hitting this cadre or this team, but of stopping or slowing down the terrorist attacks overall? That's a better question. And applied seriously, it might give us a useful standard. But still, if the attacks have been radically ineffective, proportionality can still be used as a restrictive standard. So this is the second way, better than the family feud model, but still wrong, of condemning the high-tech army's response to insurgent and terrorist attacks. At this point, we need to turn back to the responsibility argument. Who is putting these civilians at risk? The immediate answer is that they are being put at risk by the insurgents or terrorists who hide among the civilian population or fire from civilian cover. This is a hard argument to make politically these days, though it's readily understandable in the starkest cases. If civilian hostage, hostages are strapped to tanks that then drive into battle, the soldiers who fire at the tanks and kill the hostages are not responsible for the deaths they cause. On the other hand, if there were a way of disabling the tanks without killing the hostages, that is what the soldiers should do, even if doing it is marginally more risky for them. And similarly, in responding to attacks from civilian cover, soldiers must make some effort to find out how many civilians are at risk so that proportionality can be calculated at least roughly and some effort to get close enough to aim at the insurgent or terrorist cadre. They are not totally irresponsible in these cases, but it is critically important to insist on the initial shift of responsibility <coughs> to the other side. In thinking about the risks that soldiers must take in these cases, there is a political argument that I want to note but not focus on. Often the insurgents are not hiding among civilians for their own protection. 
In that sense, the phrase human shields may be misleading. They are hiding among civilians in order to expose the civilians to attack because they believe, and they are probably right, that the death of these civilians will work to their advantage. And so that would suggest that the risks soldiers take to minimize civilian deaths may well be required by their military mission and not by mere morality. But my own interest right here today is in mere morality. The insurgents, of course, don't acknowledge that they're deliberately exposing civilians. They claim that if they don't fight from civilian cover, they will increase the risks to themselves and to their cause. Suppose their cause were just, as in, say, the national liberation struggle of Algerians against the French in the 1950s, which is an early, a very early example of asymmetric warfare. What risks must the Algerian insurgents accept? They certainly can't put bombs in cafes and bus stations as they did. The deliberate killing of innocent people is ruled out from the beginning. They must seek alternative ways of fighting even if the risks of failure are greater. Actually, I don't think that they're greater, but that is, again, a subject for another time. Fighting from civilian cover is a harder question. And at this point in the argument, we need to think about whether there's any kind of baseline for our calculations. The, the importance of doing this was suggested to me by Noam Zohar, who is a professor at this uh, university. And I'm, I'm going to do uh, what I don't, what I usually don't like to do, uh, describe a series of hypothetical situations. So please bear with me for a slightly technical uh, argument. I'll try to make my hypotheticals as realistic as I can. So imagine a military attack by insurgent forces from a camouflaged position in a forest or a field on the outskirts of a city. I take this example from a documentary about the French resistance in World War II, so it's not entirely hypothetical. The attack is directed against a passing army unit. There are some risks, obviously, for the attackers, and a small number of civilians living or working nearby may be endangered, not a disproportionate number, according to the insurgents' calculations of military benefit. Take this as the standard or baseline case. It doesn't involve terrorism, and the cover is vegetative, not human. Now, if the fighters move from this position into the city and hide and fight, attacking their enemies from the midst of the civilian population, they would reduce the risk to themselves at the expense of the civilians among whom they are hiding. They would, so to speak, be offloading risk from themselves to non-combatant men, women, and children. And I think we should say flatly that that's morally wrong. They are not morally allowed to do that. And if they do it, they are responsible for the civilian casualties caused by any counterattack, or at least by any careful, well-aimed counterattack. But suppose we change the baseline. The insurgent or terrorist forces are in the city center because that's where they live. That's where they've always lived. And anyway, the open spaces around the city are controlled by the army. Surely the insurgents can fight from where they live. On the other hand, they could move into more sparsely inhabited parts of the city and fight from there. And if they did that, they would reduce the risk to civilians in the densely populated neighborhoods and take on greater risk for themselves. Are they bound to do that? I want to say yes. Offloading risk seems worse than refusing to take positive measures that would reduce risk, but both seem wrong to me. And if they're wrong for the insurgents, then they must be wrong for soldiers also. So now, imagine an army planning an attack on a legitimate military target 
Its strategists and tactical experts have worked out a plan that involves some degree of risk for the soldiers, but given the importance of the target, the risk is acceptable. And there are foreseeable civilian deaths, but the number is not disproportionate to the value of the target. Now some junior officer comes along and says that he has a plan that will reduce the risks to soldiers, but increase the risks to civilians, though not to a level that violates the proportionality rule. If this officer's proposal is adopted, it would be soldiers, not insurgents, who are offloading risk. Is that the right thing to do? They wouldn't be using civilians as shields. I'm not suggesting a simple equation here. But they would be benefiting from a strategy that deliberately puts civilians in harm's way for the sake of the benefit. And I don't think we would want them to do that. Now imagine another junior officer who comes along and he has a plan that will greatly reduce the risks to civilians but increase slightly the risks to soldiers without endangering the mission. Should the soldiers be asked to accept the added risk in order to avoid killing civilians? And once again, I find it easier to say no to my first question about offloading risk than yes to the second about adding it on but both these answers are probably right. And they suggest what responsible people, moral agents, ought to do in the circumstances of war. But these hypothetical examples, as you all will have recognized, are highly artificial. In practice, in the actual circumstances of warfare, we do not have a baseline. And we don't know at any moment in real time if the question soldiers face is about offloading risk onto civilians or adding it on for themselves. So perhaps we needn't work very hard to distinguish between the two. We should just notice that these are two possible ways of describing the situation. And then all we need is an argument about risk itself. And that argument should go this way in planning and conducting military operations that endanger civilians. Strategists and soldiers, and insurgents too, must take care and take risks to reduce the dangers they are imposing. They have choices to make, and the lives of unarmed and vulnerable civilians, men, women, and children, have to figure significantly in those choices. I won't make any effort to specify how much risk soldiers or insurgents ought to accept. I've already said that that's a judgment call, and the judgments have to be made by field officers, or at least by officers who know the field. International law and just war theory can only provide rough guidelines. Still, the guidelines are important, and the training of soldiers, and especially the professional training of officers, should include a serious engagement with these guidelines, a discussion of their meaning, a study of actual cases in which they were applied well or badly. And it should also include exercises that prepare soldiers to apply them well. It is incompetence, above all, that produces brutality. And so we need soldiers who are trained to act competently in these difficult situations. Only this kind of training can give us some confidence in the judgment calls that they will make. And since we are all of us civilians at some point in our lives, and many of our friends and relatives are civilians right now, we know, as the Bible says, the spirit, the nefesh of civilians. And so we need that confidence. Thank you.